Welcome back, everybody. We hope you enjoyed a lovely break. So identifying and removing barriers for diversity groups is increasingly becoming a priority for government and the services they fund. So what initiatives are improving access and promoting inclusion for people with disabilities? On board, we have a hardworking crew to show us the ropes across several portfolios. The portfolio areas were chosen by disability advocates themselves as the four most problematic areas for people with disabilities. You'll be presented with lightning initiative snapshots for each area. So you have your say on how progressive they are. Does the apparent genuine desire to make inclusion real for people with disabilities equal actual progress? Or are we just rearranging the deck chairs? So we'll hear from each person one by one and cover housing, family violence, mental health and well-being, and justice in the legal system. First, with housing, Maya Ramakrishnan. Thanks very much, Melissa, and thank you for having me here today. Um, before I get into my presentation, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recognise that sovereignty of this land has not been ceded. Um, so as Melissa said, I'll be talking about housing, um, and I would preface this by saying that um, I'll give a bit of an overview of the system and some of the uh, actions and investments that government has made to improve outcomes in the housing space. Um, but I do want to say up front that we know that more can be done and actually the, the real value and richness of these discussions is I can tell you what we are doing, but what we would really value is to hear what we're not doing or what we should be doing differently. So I, I just wanted to, to lay out that context up front. Um, Happy to step to the next slide. So um, a lot of people would, would sort of be familiar with the idea of the housing continuum, which spans um, the range of housing circumstances that people can find themselves in, which might be through from experiencing homelessness, maybe needing access to social housing, which can be public or community housing, through to thinking about pathways into home ownership. Uh, the scale and the pressures that exist across the housing system, um, including for people with disability, differs. And um, I guess two points to, that I wanted to draw out here is that while it's presented as a linear continuum, of course, we know that it's not linear at all and that people's experiences can um, change and you can be in one housing circumstance and that can change very quickly. Um, and I guess the other thing that I wanted to draw out is that, you know, even though the, the idea of crisis accommodation, transitional accommodation, social housing, private rental home ownership are depicted as boxes on this slide. Of course, it's not as neat as that because there are so many interconnections and you know, if the housing market is not working, we will see increases in homelessness or demand for social housing. Similarly, we know that if there's not enough social housing, that puts a lot of pressure on the crisis and transitional accommodation setting. Um, but this was really to set the context to say we know that the housing system is large and experiences can vary throughout that continuum. Um, so I work at Homes Victoria in the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Um, and Homes Victoria has actions that span across the housing continuum but don't cover all of it. So just by way, way of context, Homes Victoria is responsible for um, funding homelessness services um, we're also the provider of public housing, which is home for over 100,000 people in Victoria, um, and also fund the community housing sector, um, most notably at the moment through the Big Housing Build, which is a growth program um, to increase stock in, in social housing. Um, but of course, there are other parts of government that also play a role, and I'm happy to take all and any questions or, or um, comments, um, I might not be able to answer all of it, but, but really keen to hear constructive um, feedback from, from this group. Um, if we step to the next slide, um, in addition to those um, aspects of housing, uh, the, the department also runs, is a provider of specialist disability accommodation um, and also provides funding into the supported residential services system. 
I might go into um, some of the work that is happening within the Department and Homes Victoria. And I know that this has been spoken about earlier in um, the sessions today. Um, the overarching framework by which we're working from is the State Disability Plan, Inclusive Victoria. Um, and there are particular elements in the State Disability Plan that reference housing, um, including embedding accessibility, uh, improving renter protections, and providing high quality, safe and secure housing. Um, there's also legislative changes that the government has progressed in respect of ensuring that residential protections are clearer for people with a disability. Um, but what I might spend the rest of this session on is just two aspects um, of the social housing system where government has made um, investment and just spend a little bit time of that. And as I said, you know, this is a, we think this is a step in the right direction, but of course we know that there's, there's much more that can be done. Um, so back in November 2020, uh, the Victorian government announced a capital, a capital program of just over $5 billion into social and affordable housing. Um, that will deliver over 12,000 new social and affordable homes. Um, about 8,200 of those will be uh, within the social housing system. Uh, through the delivery of the big housing bill, there has been consideration around how we can use the money that government has put towards growth in social housing to ensure that there is a focus on, on people with disability. And um, one aspect of that is around ensuring that new builds that are delivered through Homes Victoria are up to um, the Livable Housing Australia Silver level. Um, that obviously, that is, a, I, I guess, a, a baseline level of accessibility that we are building into our new dwellings. We know that that doesn't deliver tailored bespoke arrangements, but includes things like step-free accesses to homes, um, reinforced walls, so grab rails and the like can be installed either then or at a later date. Um, things like toilets on the, on the ground level um, and, and so forth. Um, in addition to that, there is also a commitment um, to ensure that 5% of new social housing dwellings constructed by Homes Victoria have a high level of accessibility. So that goes above and beyond the livable silver standards. So accessible kitchens, accessible bathrooms and a level of tailoring above livable silver. Um, in addition to that, that's mostly around, I guess, physical accessibility of homes. Through the big housing build, um, there is also a commitment of 2,000 homes for people experiencing mental illness um, who might be in need of psychosocial supports. Um, and that is a direct um, implementation of one of the recommendations from the Royal Commission into Mental Health. Yeah. Is that, is that better? Thank you. Um, so that's a bit of an overview of the big housing build and the steps that government is trying to take to use investment to, to improve outcomes um, through specific commissioning approaches and requirements through delivery of, of new homes. Um, so the next component is around access to social housing um, and the pathway into social housing, whether that's public or community housing is through the Victorian Housing Register, which is effectively the common entry point that someone can put an application in, register their interest for social or need for social housing, um, and in turn um, be able to access uh, social housing. And we, we know that the demand for social housing at the moment is, is far in excess of um, the available stock that we can. And so Programs like the Big Housing Build are incredibly important, but they won't solve that demand supply mismatch that we see at the moment. Um, but the, I guess the, the, the things that I wanted to draw out with the, the VHR, as it's known, um, is around what are the pathways for um, people with disability to access social housing through the VHR. Um, the way that the, the, the wait list is structured is around several categories of access um, to sort of be able to get access, there are the, the sort of standard requirements in, in a sense around income and asset limits, but then there are certain access categories that um, provide particular pathways for um, people's circumstances. So one which is highlighted on the slide here is around 
a category which is termed the supported housing category. Um, and that is for people that might require structural modification um, or personal support to live independently in social housing. That is one specific pathway into that housing system that accounts for supported housing needs. Um, but it's important to say that there are other access categories that um, somebody who is ex living with disability can access. So for example, if somebody was at risk of homelessness, they can also access um, social housing or register their interest for social housing through a homelessness um, category of the VHR. Um, in addition, there is um, a pathway that allows a person who is applying for social housing to put in a special accommodation requirement. And that can specify things like locational needs or, um, or capital or housing needs around um, their personal circumstances. Um, as I said, the, the wait list is long at the moment and, and there's probably no pussyfooting around that. Um, and so, again, I know that there's an intention to break up into smaller rooms. You know, we would really value opinions on how we can make those pathways more accessible um, to people in need of social housing. And if we click to the last slide, which I've got the one minute to go. So um, there's obviously, like I said at the start, we're really keen to know what we're not doing or what we could be doing better, because while we've talked about incredible investment into the system, we know that that's not enough. Um, and then the last prompt was, we've got a change in the Commonwealth Government and a range of commitments there, um, including a national housing and homelessness plan, um, which um, could be a vehicle to work together in partnership across levels of government um, to improve outcomes. So with that, I would say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Maya, for accepting the 10 minute challenge. Okay, so next I'd like to welcome Joan Hargrave to speak about family violence. Hi folks. So family violence reforms. You might remember the Royal Commission into Family Violence and back in Janu January, if you were seeing the news, you might have seen celebration that all of its recommendations had been implemented. But I thought I might start by taking a step back and providing some context. The family violence service sector began as feminist collectives and they began as volunteers. They set up refuges from any type of property they could get and created these old share houses that were usually pretty worn down. And then in the 90s, Victorian Women's Disability Network also started as a feminist collective. And one of their primary concerns was around how the, those services and those refuges become accessible for women with disabilities because the rates of violence we experience are so high and we experience that violence for such a long time. And it also, of course, impacts our children um, seriously as well. Then things started shifting around 20 years ago um, you might recall the state government started counting the economic costs of family violence, putting that at about $3.4 billion a year um, and realising that women were missing work, children were missing school. It, this made up 40% of police work. It was the biggest cause of homelessness in the state and so on. It was also the biggest cause of death, disease, oh, sorry, the biggest contributor towards death, disease and disability for working aged women in Victoria. Then some amazing collaboration sparked between different departments of government who were actually working with family violence services. People sat around tables and they had some pretty serious debates and disagreements, but they also, over a really long period of time, built up some agreements. And we start to see, started to see a service system develop that included police and courts and refuges and the Women with Disabilities Network was there at the table. And, um, you know, it wasn't perfect by any means from what Julianne was speaking about this morning with her experience with police. We know it didn't always work well, but we were building up some shared understandings and a system. Then around 10 years ago, we had some really high profile cases of family violence deaths that then suddenly this was no longer a taboo. 
this was no longer denied. It was now a big political issue. And it was an issue that got taken to the um, state election. And around that time, the new premier, Danielle Andrews, announced that he would hold a royal commission. So some people were super excited at the idea of a royal commission. They said, finally, this is getting attention. Others of us, I have to admit, I was one of them, thought, well, do we really need one? We know royal commissions usually don't get implemented. They're so expensive. Um, and we've already spent so much time and had so many inquiries. We already know what we need to do. But then we had some good surprises. Um, some fantastic commissioners were appointed, like Marcy and Neve, who's so well respected. And surprisingly, the Premier promised, before even knowing what all the recommendations would be, that they would all get implemented, which was really unusual. Victims shared their stories and many organisations shared reams of evidence. And um, I guess that's why I was chosen to speak today. I was part of that process of supporting victims and sharing evidence and then working through gov with government on some of the recommendations. So the report was released in 2016. It made 227 recommendations. Uh, would you believe that it, the report weighed five kilograms? <laughs> so a regular textbook usually weighs about one kilogram. This had eight volumes and um, people still remember that they got a sore arm trying to carry, carry it around. Um, someone said to me once it found a place on the bookshelf, it never moved. Um, now this was what was really interesting too. The Premier promised $550 million in new funding for implementing the recommendations. This was huge. And suddenly for the first time, family violence was actually its own budget item. It wasn't something that was just coming out of the homelessness budget. Um, and also interestingly, an independent monitor was appointed who would report to parliament and say whether or not implementation was being done well. We were blown away by the report's recommendations. There were actually 16 recommendations that were specific to um, people with disabilities and mental health issues. The commission really heard what we'd all been saying um, and all the recommendations were either things that we supported or things that we directly recommended. It was just an amazing experience. I'll mention a couple of the key recommendations here. Um, one was much needed money for workforce development. And we were really lucky to be able to appoint some appropriately experienced people to that project. It's really hard to find people with expertise across disability and family violence practice. Uh, so what could go wrong? <laughs> well, it was an 18 month project and the project had to be built around other bits of fam um, Victoria's government policy, but those hadn't been developed yet. And in fact, the people working on that project didn't receive those um, important other policies until at least 12 months into that 18 month project. So it became a really difficult project to um, try and roll out. And it was um, to teach the family violence sector about disability access and rights. Um, but of course, you might have seen this with other training programs. Once the funding's finished, the workers are gone and the training doesn't get rolled out anymore. A second example was around the refuge redevelopments. And this was a huge one for us. The recommendation was that new refuges would get built in a core and cluster model, which is like individual units with some shared buildings for shared services and activities. This is so important so that support workers can come into a unit and provide support just to one person. It's much better for kids to have their own space while they start their recovery journey and so many other aspects of that. And um, at, at least one unit in each government area was supposed to be disability accessible. Unfortunately, what we've found is that um, while those units might technically meet access standards, they functionally don't. So there's problems like intercoms not working for deaf people, fire doors being too heavy to open, um, ramps don't align properly with doors the right in a functional way. Um, the bench tops are at fixed heights that doesn't allow for different working heights. Um, what's probably most upsetting about this is that we haven't taken the opportunity to learn from mistakes because we'd had three accessible refuges funded back in that economic surplus package around from Kevin Rudd around 2010. And we'd learnt then that if there weren't people standing, watching, making sure that things were built to be disability accessible, 
that things didn't work properly. Um, only this time around, it was much more complicated because there were so many more government departments and contractors involved. Uh, so that was quite disappointing. And then thirdly, there were some recommendations to COAG. If you remember that Council of Australian Governments where the states used to meet with the Commonwealth and the recommendations were that the Victorian government speak to COAG to make sure that the NDIS recognised family violence. Now, those recommendations got ticked off as being implemented, but we've never actually been able to find out what happened or hear of what discussion actually occurred. So for all intents and purposes, they um, nothing happened. <laughs> um, So yeah, the age reported in 2016 that when the report came out, um, that the commission found um, family the family violence system in Victoria was a patchwork of underfunded services. And it emphasized the importance and scarcity of housing for women and their children fleeing family violence. I'd say the same could be said still today, unfortunately, that it's un the services are underfunded it's a and it's a patchwork and there's not enough accommodation. Um, so where did it go wrong? I'd say for from mainly from the perspective of people with disabilities, there were three key things. The NDIS got implemented just at exactly the same time as the Royal Commission findings, which put us in that sort of Bermuda Triangle between the state and the Commonwealth and makes that interface really hard to, uh, to address where there are problems. Secondly, so much of the money went into the government itself. Um, and you might recall the Victorian Auditor General wrote quite a strong report about how the money was being, um, it could have been better used. Um, uh, so that really um, provided some evidence around that point. And thirdly, um, the workforce grew so rapidly and I think um, that creates some real challenges uh, around how you build up understandings around family violence and disability access when you've got such a growing workforce, which of course is a huge, huge positive um, to have more people involved and on board, but how do you keep that continuity and that mission clear? So um, I think in conclusion, I'd say the main takeaway for me is whatever you think of the upcoming recommendations from the soon to be released Disability Royal Commission report, what it achieves will be in its implementation. So as the funding starts falling on us, we need to stay connected with the grassroots and keep listening to people on the ground and keeping a focus on what services need to be delivered. And um, as new people come on board to be thinking about how we support them to keep working on the vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. So that was family violence. And now we're going to go to mental health and wellbeing, Monica Kelly. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay at the back? I think I need to drop it down a little bit. Um, Thank you for having me here today. Um, as you know, my name is Monica Kelly and I'm the State Mental Health and Wellbeing Promotion Advisor, which is one of the positions that was recommended by the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. And thank you, Jen, for providing a lovely overview of Royal Commissions because we've followed on from the Family Violence Royal Commission and tried to learn some of those lessons, but you've given a good overview of how that works. Um, Next slide, thanks. Uh, when I was asked to present here, I guess it was one of those moments where work and life collide. And I really feel like I could have been um, in the audience today as the mother of two daughters with different disabilities. And I hope I do justice um, to both of the perspectives that I bring in the room today. But it reminds me, and I think what Jen has just talked about is that one of the strongest findings of the Royal Commission into Mental Health Services was the need to include lived and living experience throughout every step of the process. And we take that broadly, that's lived and living experience of people with um, mental distress and experience in our mental health system, but also people in three communities were identified specifically, and one being um, communities of people with disability, LGBTIQ plus communities. <laughs> 
Great. Um, <laughs> and also multicultural communities. So I just want to acknowledge the lived and living experience that you all um, bring into the room today and how much of a difference that makes. And again, Jen's already given a great example of it. it's when people are standing alongside with that in the moment and providing that, that it makes the most difference. So um, why is equity important? And look, this is probably, again, preaching to people that already know about this, but I look back to a time about 10 years ago when I was involved in doing a research summary on the health issues of people with disabilities and trying to get some of that published. And people from the public health community, which is my background, had said, no, we don't need to do that. This is not a public health issue. And that comes from the assumption that many of the health issues people um, had were related to their disability, which we all know is not the case, that actually they're mostly due to the socioeconomic determinants that people face as a result of um, their disability. And so we have really tried to reflect that in our policy work that we're undertaking in the department, looking from a mental health lens and use that human rights frame because I think it is so important and it's also one of the tools that I hope will give us for advocacy kind of going into the future. So I just wanna talk, and it is really hard to try and summarize this Royal Commission. Um, so slide four, there, there were 74 recommendations, so we're slightly better. Um, seven key themes, and some of those I wanted to share. There's plenty of this online if people wanna delve in further, but the importance of care closer to home, the importance of lived and living experience, as I've talked about, the need to promote wellbeing or prevent, um, and there is so much that can happen in this space and the need to think about the mental health and wellbeing system of the future. And I guess that's where I probably want to spend my time because this does take time. I want to see this system change today. I'm sure you do too, but it will take time. And as Jen has again already said, the success will be in the implementation and for it to meet the needs of people with disabilities, people need to be alongside um, that journey as we go. So, I think I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are the most important where we're at in this journey to date, um, noting that many of the recommendations are underway. The first of those is the Mental Health and Wellbeing Act. Next slide, thanks. Um, which, oh, thank you, you're already there. Um, which is a really important underpinning and came into being just last Friday on the 1st of September because it gives greater protection and new powers for the new um, commission that strengthens those rights-based principles. So services will need to have proper consideration to the principles, one of those being the need to actually meet the needs of people um, from diverse communities, including people with disabilities. But, you know, again, we can go to this is what you do when things go wrong. I'm more interested in the how do we get it right and prevent that in the first place. So um, I'm responsible for part of this work, not all of it. So I wanted to talk to three of the strategies that we're um, in the final stages of developing at the moment. The first of those is a wellbeing strategy, which is for all Victorians. And when we say all, we certainly intend to mean all. And that's um, about change in the places where we live, learn, work and play, because that's actually where wellbeing is created. The second strategy that we're working on is a diverse communities framework and blueprint. Um, and we've had people with lived and living experience deeply uh, engaged in this process through multiple um, consultation processes, but also with an expert advisory committee. And it really talks to change at all levels of the mental health and wellbeing system. So, um, and when I say, you know, mental health and wellbeing system, I don't just mean what happens in hospitals or health services, but what happens in our communities. And so all of the things that um, I'm sure you will be talking about today and spend your lives talking about, that's where the change needs to happen. So the wellbeing plan and the diverse communities framework acknowledges that. And it is a whole of Victorian government plan for that reason. It's not just the health department that can deliver on that. 
There will also be two-year implementation plans, so it's a 10-year strategy, because we recognise the need to adjust as we go. And there's already been some change. You know, the photo of Scarlett that I showed before was her after her first vaccination with COVID. And I was terrified that I couldn't get her vaccinated. And then I found out about disability liaison officers who made it possible. And that's the sort of thing that I know it wasn't me, but someone... A, advocated for in the first place and B, advocated for the continuation of. So we still have those. And I can't tell you how much of a difference it made for us to get Scarlet vaccinated. So I think COVID showed us um, that there are higher expectations and we need to do things better for people with disability. And we all need to kind of use that um, as a reminder and so for us, we wanted two-year plans because we recognise that communities are changing and we need to be able to adapt and adjust as we go. The one other thing I wanted to mention, there is a grants program that will be coming out again to support the participation of communities in, you know, across all of the reforms going forward. Um, so please look out for that. And the third one that we're working on is a suicide prevention and response strategy, which draws on that wellbeing plan because everybody needs to have the things that keep them strong and keep their well-being good, um, but also draws on the equity heart of the diverse communities framework and then thinks through the needs for people experiencing suicidality, which unfortunately, um, you know, there is over-representation from some communities with disabilities in that regard as well. So it's, it's, I know it's your question to answer how we're going rather than me, but I couldn't help reflect and think about what's changed um, since we've started, which is only two years in. We're only two years into a 10-year-plus journey. And so the, I think the things that um, are real that have changed is the legislation coming into effect with stronger powers, the, the policy foundations and all three of those strategies are due for release later this year. Um, and that there is awareness. So all of the staff across mental health and wellbeing division, it is a core capability that they have understanding of diversity and actively continue to learn about that. Now that's easier said than done. And again, Jen's reflected on some of how that happens. We know there is more work to do there. And you know there is also a strong priority for that to happen within mental health services as well. Um, and the other one I think has been the engagement of people with disability across the reform. It's been really strong in the diverse communities framework, but I think we have got places to improve um, across the reform work. And that's the thing that I would say, I would love to see as many of you as possible participate in. You know, there are opportunities, there is a lived and living experience register. Um, there is uh, regional, interim regional bodies for people to be able to get involved in as well, because it's when we're standing alongside people making changes that it will make the most difference. So I know that's a very quick tour and there's lots more that I could say about the different services, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight and I'm really looking forward to your reflections as well. And we'll definitely take those back and share them with my colleagues in the department. Thank you. And the last um, yeah, contact details. Thank you very much, Monica. And last but certainly not least, uh, for justice and the legal system, Karen Taranto. Hi all, um, it's a pleasure to be with you today here on Wurundjeri Country. I echo others in paying my respects to First Nations people and country. As I'm here to talk to you about justice and the legal system, it's important to note the disproportionate harm this system causes First Nations people. As Victoria progresses towards treaty and Australia will soon vote on whether to enshrine an Aboriginal voice to parliament and in our constitution. And actually, as we've been sitting here today, the Yuruk Truth Telling Commission has released one of their reports um, into the criminal justice system today. Um, I'm hopeful that these major reforms will create the conditions for specific changes needed in our laws and institutions to end systemic overrepresentation and the harms that justice system involvement continues to perpetrate to First Nations people. 
Um, I'm very humbled to be a late addition to this panel, um, having started my career in the disability sector, and I know many of you from my time in the sector, um, and I attended, many, uh, attended this conference many times as a participant. I want to acknowledge our colleagues on the panel today from Victorian government departments um, and the perspective they bring from leading critical government reforms. Um, like Jen and all of you here today, I work for a community sector organisation. So the focus of my presentation will be on key reforms that we support um, and are interested in that will make inclusion real for people with disability in the justice and legal system. So I'll begin with a bit of a bird's eye view of what's happening in those systems and then go into a bit more detail about specific reforms and programs um, that I'm looking forward to discussing with you when we go to our breakouts after this session. So a good place to begin is with the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. And I want to acknowledge many of you who have been deeply engaged with the work of that Royal Commission. Um, it, um, it was, um, the criminal justice system was the subject um, of much, many of the hearings and an issues paper um, for that Royal Commission. Um, and it found that um, people with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system as victims, accused persons, defendants, and witnesses. Um, and it also heard that this overrepresentation is driven predominantly by systemic failings, which highlights the need for reforms, including um, access to appropriate supports and particularly housing, a lack of disability awareness and identification by services and institutions, lack of accessible diversionary options in the system, barriers to accessing justice and barriers to reporting and investigating experiences of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. We know the Victorian government has been monitoring the Royal Commission and we're expecting targeted reforms to um, be recommended and implemented in the coming months when the Royal Commission releases its final report. At VCOS, our work in the justice space is underpinned by two key principles. The first is to prevent people from becoming justice involved in the first place. And the second is for those people who do end up becoming justice involved, how can we make their time in the justice system the least harmful it can be? And how can we make sure that people can access the best therapeutic supports possible so that they can never be involved, uh, become involved with the justice system again? So we're ahead of big changes likely to occur following the Royal Commission and indeed today's um, Uruk report. Um, I thought it would be helpful to cover some reforms that are already in train under these two domains. So going first to prevention, we know that statistically there's a clear link between disadvantage and justice system involvement. So the best way of preventing people from becoming involved with the justice system in the first place is for people to live a life of well-being and make sure supports are available in their communities if needed. A growing body of research in recent years highlights that people who become involved with or criminalised often face a range of health or social issues that may not have been identified or if identified had not been treated. For example, mental health issues. Um, nearly half of people entering prison um, report a mental health issue, and many of those um, have never received any treatment or support for that until entering prison. Um, so it was great to hear from Monica about reforms happening in this space. For women in particular, there's a clear link between victimisation, uh, especially family violence, and justice system involvement. For many, these experiences may have been undisclosed, and by the time they reach the justice system, they may have trauma or other mental health conditions or be using illicit drugs to deal with these experiences, and that's what's driven them into justice system involvement. So again, it was great to hear from Jen about the Family Violence Royal Commission and the progress of those reforms. Um, Research also indicates that a high proportion of people with cognitive disabilities and acquired brain injury in the justice system. And a key characteristic of, of this group in corrections um, is that, that many people have not identified disability or a support need before entering prison. Um, and this point highlights the importance of disability screening at every stage of, of justice proceedings, um, which is a key theme that I'll keep referring to um, in, in these reforms. As well as health and social supports, making sure that people can access early, affordable legal assistance can help problems from escalating and further justice involvement. 
a major reform in this space has been the introduction of health justice partnerships. So this model is where a lawyer is placed in a health setting where people might already be seeking help for health or other social issues. So a person might already be engaged with the health service and have um, a trusted relationship with their health professional. Um, in the course of this engagement, they um, might talk to their health professional about a range of issues um, and might disclose something that they don't realise is a legal issue. It's just something that they're experiencing. So, for example, their rental provider might be giving them a hard time about a modification they've requested and they don't realise that there's legal recourse um, for that dispute. So um, in these partnerships, the health professional is trained to identify that this is a legal issue and a lawyer who is based in their team can be brought in to assist with the issue and resolve it before it escalates into a more serious or costly dispute. There are now 42 health justice partnerships in Victoria, including a range of health providers that deliver NDIS services. Um, so it'll be great to hear from you about your experiences with this model, if, if you have any, uh, when we go into the breakouts. So the Royal Commission also heard that people with disabilities are commonly subject to what's described, um, what the Royal Commission described as the criminalisation of disability. Um, this is where conduct associated um, with a person's disability um, leads to disproportionate interactions with the police. So in this context, disability awareness um, and responses amongst police members is crucial um, to preventing people from becoming justice involved. We know that Victoria Police introduced a new accessibility action plan in 2021, which incorporated four goals around accessibility, um, including um, police member attitudes and capabilities and more members with and support staff with disability. A couple of things VCOS members have told us over the years um, about policing and policing people with disabilities is the need for mandatory disability awareness, um, training, ongoing PD um, amongst all police members and establishing a consistent approach for police members where they um, can identify that a person has a disability, that they have knowledge of um, the service system, supports avail available to help the person access uh, the police process. Um, we want to acknowledge some work happening at the local level. We know of some individual police um, stations establishing formal um, and informal networks with um, advocacy orgs, and this is welcome. Um, but without um, ongoing training um, and those net formal networks being established across the network, um, people, and, and sorry, funding to operationalise that, um, inconsistencies and barriers to access will remain. Uh, so I'm really keen to hear from you about whether the uh, police accessibility plan has led to meaningful change. Uh, another thing I want to note that's missing from uh, policing, and yeah, again, as I said, every step further in uh, the criminal procedure process is screening. So we know that screening is important for identifying disability and the need to make adjustments or bring in support. For example, in the police process, a, a police member might identify the need for communication support or um, the next little segue is into the courts um, where screening is really important to identify whether someone would benefit from the intermediaries program. We know that courts are notoriously inaccessible and barriers to accessing processes, systems and information, including information about legal rights, um, can lead to further justice involvement. Um, in 2018, the government implemented a communication intermediaries pilot to assist victims of crime and witnesses with communication difficulties to give evidence to police and in court. But we know that uh, because of issues with COVID, um, there were barriers to fully implementing the pilot with court closures and police station closures and things moving to a remote service delivery. So the pilot has had some top up funding in subsequent budgets, but we're not sure about the scope of this program and whether it's meeting need. So that's something I'm really interested to hear from you all around whether you've had experience with that program. Um, and finally, in the last little minute that I possibly have, or maybe not, um, I'll, return, I'll turn to reforms happening in the correction system. Um, so two big pieces of work have happened in the past couple of years that will guide reforms. 
Um, the first one is the Victorian Auditor General Audit of Correction Services for People with Intellectual Disability, um, which in a nutshell was absolutely scathing of um, corrections service delivery to people with disabilities. It found that it doesn't meet their needs in terms of support provision. It found that Department of Justice doesn't actually know how many people with disabilities are in its system, which points to the issue of screening. And without knowing how many people have support needs in your system, um, it's impossible to plan um, and resource service delivery. Um, and both Department of Justice and DFFH have long waiting lists for programs, but not enough specialist beds. Um, so people um, noting, especially that many people enter corrections for very short periods of time. They may come in, experience service disruption, and then go out without having any access to supports. And then the second big piece was the cultural view of the cultural review of the adult correction system which found similar things that demand for specialist disability supports far exceeds supply, especially the few programs in corrections that have been established, especially to address the issue that I know um, is of interest to many of you, um, the gap in service provision between corrections and the NDIS. Um, and the second reason um, why support, uh, why service delivery um, is bad in corrections is because they haven't fully committed to or operationalize the Mandela rule, which states that healthcare in prison should be equivalent to healthcare in the community. And this has flow on effects um, for many people with disabilities getting other health and social supports outside of specialist disability supports that they need in corrections. So both of these reviews have made many recommendations to the government, um, which they have accepted either in full or in principle. Um, and it'll take time for these to be fully implemented and for changes to be visible. But I am interested to, um, to know whether you've seen anything flow through yet. In particular, um, a very welcome recommendation that they've made is mandatory training for all correction staff and a screening tool to identify disability when people enter the correction system. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of what's happening in justice, um, in the justice and legal system. So I'll be around for the breakouts in the next part of this session and then the rest of the day. So keen to chat with you about anything um, that I haven't covered or I've missed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. So now that we've heard all about what's happening in housing, family violence, mental health and wellbeing and justice in the legal spaces, I said that. But what's going to happen next is when you come back after the break, you'll find the room divided into four. And on the tables, there will be a label of um, which system the table is going to be talking about. So it'll be divided up between family violence, housing, mental health and wellbeing, and justice in the legal system. So I would like you to, to find a seat at the table that you want to have a deep dive discussion about, write what you think is working well, what's not working well, and what some, what are some of the ideas you might have for what needs to be um, changed on the ground. So um, I'll explain how all that works after the break. So we'll see you back at three o'clock.